Hello and welcome to the session in which we would look at the topic of data visualization. This topic is covered on the CPA exam and it's going to be covered more and more whether you are taking BEC or auditing. Data visualization is important and I'm pretty sure down the road it will be integrated with drag. Not yet, but you will bet, I'll bet with you, it will be integrated with RAG as well. Because most accounting courses, as well as FAR, because most accounting courses these days, they always add, they're starting to add maybe an appendix or a full chapter for data visualization. This means if you're a future accountant, future CPA, this is the future. Also, if you're a business student, this is the future. But from my perspective, what I care about, if you're a CPA candidate, this is what I need to help you pass the exam, farhatlectures.com. No, I don't replace your CPA review course. You keep this. I'm a useful addition to your CPA review course. I'm going to explain this topic differently, approach it from, approach it from a different perspective. By doing so, add 10 to 15 points to your CPA exam score by helping you understand your review better. You will do better on the CPA exam. Your risk is one month of subscription. Give me a try. I might be able to help you. You will find out. I have helped hundreds, if not thousands of students pass the exam. That's your risk. Your potential gain is passing the exam. Is that risk worth it? One month of subscription. And if not for anything, take a look at my website to find out how well or not well your university doing on the CPA exam. I do have resources for other accounting, finance, audit courses as well. If you haven't connected with me on LinkedIn, please do so and take a look at my LinkedIn recommendation. Like this recording, share it with other, connect with me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and connect with me. Follow me on Reddit, especially Reddit. So let's go ahead and talk about data visualization. Why data visualization is important. Now, it, it was always important, but because of technology, we are being, as human, we are becoming more creative. And as human, we are visually biased. We enjoy looking at things. We have a saying that says a picture is worth a thousand words. So it's easier for us to look at pictures and absorb information rather than, rather than read text. And this is why, for example, marketing people would use infographics to present their product, to present what they have to offer. It's easier for the consumer to look at this product. But what is data visualization? It's basically presenting data in a pictorial or a graphical format. And what's the purpose? Why do we do that? Again, because we human are visually biased, not like dogs. Dogs like the smell. So if we are dealing with dogs, we give them something that smells and it will appeal to them. But we are we like we like to to look at really nice, especially if it's nice. OK, but the purpose is to help decision makers, business makers use analytics presented visually. So what? So the users that business decision can grasp and understand difficult concept or identify new pattern in the data. So it's easier when you graph it, you can see the you can see the pattern in the data. And although you might be good at data analytics, but if you cannot communicate this information in a way that's understandable, it's, us it's usually not as effective. So that's why even though data analytics is a powerful tool, because it's you you're using the computer power to compute data, but you still have to communicate. And this is where data visualization comes into place. How do you translate this information to the users? And by the way, this is an art, not a science. So keep that in mind. When we are dealing with data visualization, we need to know what is the purpose of the data visualization. We have two purpose and we have to understand the type of data that we are dealing with, because depending on the type, we will determine what's the best way to present this information. We have two purpose for the data visualization. There's a declarative purpose, which is explaining the results of previously done analysis. And usually if you're an entry level, if you are not a programmer, um, if you're an entry level staff accountant and if you did not specialize in data analytics, you'll be expected to do some explaining, taking the data, declaring something from the data. So the audience, you're presenting the finding, the results to an audience versus exploratory data. Here you are exploring the data via visualization. Here you don't know what you have. In declarative, you already find found something and you're showing it here. You're just visualizing the data to gain an insight to somehow pick up something that's not re that, that you did not see from the raw data. OK, so gaining insight while you're interacting with the data, you don't know initially what you are looking for. You're hoping to find something. This is called exploratory. You're exploring. Sometimes it's called data mining, data discovery, knowledge discovery, whatever you want to call it. This is why this is what the purpose of uh, 
uh, data visualization. And we have basically two type of data, qualitative data or data driven and qualitative, which is also concept called conceptual. Now we're going to talk about each one of them separately. Qu quantitative, quantitative and qualitative data, starting with qualitative data. Those data are also called categorical data, categories, categorical, right? Categories. You can count them, you can group them, and in some cases you can rank them. What are we talking about here? Uh, categorical data also can be broken down into further, they can be broken down into further categories. So categorical data can be broken down into two categories. One is nominal data. What is nominal data? This is the simplest type of data. We're talking about hair color, gender, ethnic groups, age, similar things. Uh, you cannot rank or average them. Forget about age. Age you can rank, but you, you, usually those things you cannot rank or average them. For example, you cannot say, uh, you know, a male better than female by gender or a hair color. Uh, the black uh, black hair color is better than the blonde, so on and so forth. You cannot you cannot rank them or one ethnic group is better than the other or you cannot find the average hair color. You cannot mix all the hair color and find the average hair color for a group. OK, this is nominal data. Ordinal data, the other type of qualitative data, you can count and categorize them, but you can also rank them. Here we're talking about, for example, when in the Olympics, they win the medal, gold, silver, and bronze. One, two, and three. You are ranking them. You can count them, categorize them, and also rank them. Or, for example, when you rank your professors at the end of the semester, rating from one to five, you scale your teacher. Letter grades is a form of ranking. Letter, not 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 a numerical you can count categorize and rank like a b c d you can rank them but you cannot find the average okay or the standard deviation or any other statistical method now bear in mind you can run something called proportion on these type of data for example you can find out the number of people with blonde hair as part of the total let's assume the total is 100 we would say that 20 percent of the people have blonde hair in this group so qualitative data, whether it's nominal or ordinal, can also be referred to as conceptual data because such data are text driven and represent concept instead of numbers. So you have to keep that in mind. This is what qualita qualitative data. It's not number. We're not talking with quantity and quantity usually imply numbers. This data is more complex. It's just more than just counting things. It usually it's made up of observations counted and ranked. OK, just like or ordinal qualitative data you can rank them you can count them but here you can compute averages standard deviation any statistical number you would like to also they can be categorized into two different groups and this is there's you know some discussion whether those two groups are uh, are uh, needed or not one is called ratio which have a zero a zero number that means zero at absence of something. So when we say zero dollar, it means you have no money, zero dollar. It means there is nothing. The other group, the ratios, is intervals. Here, zero means something. For example, when you said zero Fahrenheit or zero Celsius as the temperature, it means something. It doesn't mean there's no temperature. It means it's freezing. We're getting to the freezing temperature. So that's those are the two subgroups under quantitative data. Okay. It could also be, it can be further categorized into whether it's discrete or continuous. And what is discrete? Discrete when the numbers represent whole number, when the figure represents whole number. For example, points in a basketball game. It cannot be 143.5 versus 133, right? It's 143 versus 133, the score. Or a soccer game, you know, one one team, one, two to zero two to zero. So it's just, you know, you cannot be one and a half, right? It's those are discrete. Continuous data. Continuous data is data that can take any uh, any value within a range. For example, the height, 1.7679 centimeter. Okay. So continuous, and you're gonna see that the continuous would, would we would use a line chart. Now what are some good charts for qualitative data? Qualitative data, we can start with a bar chart, and I hope you are familiar with a bar chart. Bar chart is a graph or a chart that represents categorical data with rectangular bars with heights and or length proportional to the value they represent. The bars can be plotted vertically or horizontally. A vertical bar is called something like a, a vertical bar is sometimes called column chart. And I'm pretty sure you want to see one. This is what a bar chart would look like. Asking the children what's their favorite color, and it seems yellow is the most popular color. My son like green, but happens to be yellow here. So this is what a bar chart looks like. Pretty simple. 
this is one way to show to show qualitative data bar chart okay we, we could also represent information in a pie chart think about a pizza pie the pizza pie would look like a circle and you will cut it down usually into eight pieces eight equal pieces now what we do size of each slice is proportional to the data it represents for example this is a pie chart now the pie chart a lot of people don't like the pie chart for example here you cannot differentiate between a lot between the blue and the yellow are they equal to each other is the blue a little bit bigger than the yellow however if you if you if, if you if you put them in a, in a in a bar chart it looks much better you would know what's going on much much more easily on a pie chart now the pie chart if you add the percentages to them then it's easier then you would know that this is 12 percent and this is 11 percent this is 26 and the orange is 28 28 versus 26 so it's much easy it's much easier to read okay you can also use what we called stag bar chart again depending on what you are looking at you could use the numbers you know or you could use per percentages but those are charts that are usually good for qualitative data we can also use other chart to show the proportion and qualitative data such as tree maps and heat maps symbol maps word clouds which is sometimes it's called sentiment analysis what is tree map or tree mapping is a method for displaying hierarch hierarchical data using nested figure usually rectangles something that looks like this if you watch uh, CNBC or follow the stock market this is the S&P 500 and for example Apple alone represent 0.23 of the S&P 500 Microsoft represent this much not 0.23 this is the change for that day but the rectangle tells you for example between Microsoft and Apple they represent a huge portion and Google so notice and Amazon those are the big names let's see where Facebook is uh where's, where's Facebook maybe it wasn't as big when this uh, when this chart was making but now if you look at Facebook it's it's it was it's large okay so notice what it shows it shows you the proportion but in form of rectangular okay so you can easily identify the big pieces in any group another one is symbol maps it's basically uh, using markers often a circle position on a map the marker is sized according to the quant quantitative value something that looks like this the location of Walmart stores in the United States for example here if it's the biggest circle it means 100 stores for example if we see here Texas California Florida they have 100 stores for example here we see less than you know small stores maybe five around five stores okay so it's easier to see the data like this clouds uh, word clouds or sentiment analysis this is when you have text and it's a visual representation of words and what I did actually I did run a word clouds on on my YouTube on my YouTube uh, on my YouTube comments and basically great an explanation uh, those were common words that they are used uh, please use so on and so forth those are the repeat words smaller one so explanation is good it's basically great explanation I get this a lot so that's why it's showing great explanation I thought it, it used to be thank you a long time ago I don't know what happened now people are just using you know signs images for thank you now let's talk about techniques that deal with quantitative data um, all the method that we mentioned for the qualitative data can also work to show quantitative data okay so they work for both of course but we have we, we can use more comp we can you we can we can have better charts for quantitative data one of them is line chart and I hope you are familiar with line chart show similar information to what a chart would show okay but line chart are good for showing data across time okay so it looks something like this okay and for example here it could be monthly okay or January February March and this could be sales okay we can see how sales is changing over time useful for continuous data bar chart is usually good for discrete data and line chart are not recommended for qualitative data if it's qualitative data you know you know if whether someone has uh, blonde hair black hair it doesn't really matter okay which by nature of being categorical and never and never be continuous anyway so this is what we what we mean by line chart it shows you what's happening for example the change of seal over time box and whisker plot that's another data useful for when quartiles median and outliners are required for analysis and insight and I I, I like box and whisker plots but uh, you have to understand how it's work for example 
um, let's take a look at this here. Here, let's assume this is the uh, the 911 weekly calls to a calling center. Week one, 10 calls. Week two, 17. Week three, five. Week four, 32. Week five, 16, 18, and 20. So how do we build this box and whisker plot for this call center? You know, how many calls do they get 911 so we can staff it? Okay, uh, first we put them, we, we put them in order 5, 10, 16, 17, 18, 20, and 22. Okay, and what we do first is we draw a line, and first we're going to pick the extremes the upper extreme and the lower extreme. We notice in one week we only had five calls, so that's going to be the five, the minimum. This is the five here, and in one week we had 32 calls, those are the outliers or the extremes. Then we need to find out the median. The median is the middle point. Well, we count which one is the middle point. One, two, there are seven of them, and the middle point is 17, the middle. So this is this is the 17. This is the median. Okay, if, we, if we're drawing the line here, this will be the median, 17. This is the median, 17. And 17 is the middle. It cuts, it cuts the data into the upper and lower quartile. Okay, so notice what happened here. 17 right here we have this is the upper and this is the lower okay now if we have even numbers because here we have only seven numbers what we do if we have even numbers like eight we'll take the two in the middle and we average them up to find the me the median number now what we do is we find the median and the upper quartile which is 20 and this will be 20 this will be 20 and the median and the lower quartile which will be 10 and this will be the number 10. Now we draw a box, okay? Now what we say is this. Yes, sometimes we do get five calls, sometimes we do get 32 calls, but those are extreme, upper and lower extreme. Most of the stuff occur between 10 and, yeah, 10 and 20, 10 and 20. So when we need the staff, we need to kind of expect 10 to 20. So most of them in 10 to 20. Now this is 25%, 25%, 25% quarter. Okay? Quartile, quarter. So this is, we break the data into four quartile to find out where the data falls around the middle. Another technique to show qualitative, quantitative data is scattered plot. It identified the correlation between two variables for identifying a trend line or a, or or line of best fit. The best way to kind of expl explain scatter plot, let's assume you are studying for the CPA exam. I'll have to say the more hours you put, the higher is you, or the more likely you are going to pass, the more likely you will get 75 or more. So this is basically what we're doing is we're finding the relationship between a dependent and an independent variable. So your score is dependent upon the time you study, assuming you are study using valuable time, the more time you study, even for your even for your courses, the more time you put into your studies, usually the higher is your score. But scatter plot is used in the real world and usually it's advertising, and I'm pretty sure you saw this, advertising versus sales. And the more advertising you spend, data shows, the higher is your sales. And usually what marketing people, they will show you this on a graph. This is a scatter plot and they usually they would run a regression and you will have R to find out what's the, to measure the uh, the fitness of the line how close are these dots to the line the closer they are the fittest is the line so this is 0.96 this is pretty fit filled geographic maps is another way to show quantitative data and this is a little bit different than the symbol maps a filled geographical map it's filled the colors are filled is used to illustrate data ranges for quantitative data and if you use tableau you can easily do this across different geographical areas such as state and, and countries. And I'm going to actually show you my actual uh, website, data analytics. Uh, for example, here, the blue are countries where I, where my viewers are. Notice the dark blue in the U.S. It means most of the viewers are in the U.S. And I'm not sure if you can see this. This is India. And my next country is India, like in terms of viewers. It's a little bit lighter, a darker Darker than the rest, darker blue. I'm not sure if you could see it in your screen or not. And the rest, Australia, South Africa, the Philippines, some countries in Europe. I have no one, practically no one in Russia. This is Russia. This is why it's like blank. Okay. Um, so the darker the blue, the more users I have. And obviously I have the numbers, for example, how many viewers I have in the U.S. versus other countries. And it shows me, it showed me in a filled geographical area, the quantitative aspect of it.
Now, what you need to know about, what else you need to know about the data, you need to be aware of a few things, how to scale the data and what increments to use. We don't, we're not gonna talk about the increment because the software you're using, usually they would recommend a good increment. But how much data do you need to share in visual, uh, in the visual to avoid misleading? So you, you have to be very careful not to show too much or you're misleading or, or not to omit stuff because you want to hide something. So this is one of the questions that when you're presenting data, how much should I include? Should I include two years versus four years? So I only show the four quarters. The key is not to hide any data that doesn't work for your expectation. So for example, if the last four quarters are good and the prior three years were not, you'd only show the first, the last four quarters. And what you do is you'll hide the other data. That's not good. That's not how you show data. Uh, for example, if you show it yearly, it might it might look better than quarterly or, you know, a period of two years is better than four years because, you know, the first two years we were not doing good. So how much data to include? This is this is basically an ethical question, a professional, you have to make a professional judgment. How to deal with outliers when you have, for example, in one year, not a lot of sales or a lot of sales or good one point that's really outlier out there. Should you include it? Should, should it be displayed? Because if the purpose is to draw attention to it, if it's important, then you want to include it. Or if it's just noise, like it's not really relevant because we, we can explain it. So don't include it in the data because it, the data would look bad. It's not that doesn't look bad. It does. It doesn't represent what we need to represent. You keep it out. It's considered noise. So you have to be make a decision about the outlier. And usually when you emit the outlier, somehow you have to let them let the users know there was an outlier. It was emitted for such and such reason. Also, the scale. You know, the chart should begin usually with a baseline of zero. Now, if zero is meaningless for the data, you could find a different baseline that makes sense. But the point is, don't find a baseline that either overemphasize something or under underemphasize something, over exaggerate or or try to minimize something. So the baseline is important, the scaling. Where do you start? Also, you have to pro provide context or reference point to make any scale meaningful. For example, if you're showing a stock price of $100, it's not, it's meaningless. Is this a high price, low price? Okay, we need to know the context. How is that stock price doing over time? It was in the 500 and it dropped to 100. That's not good. If it was in the in the $20 and now it's up to 100, then, you know, it's going up. So we have to sh show it in, in, in the con context. Also, we have to to show the company's industry and its competitor stock prices of that relevant, how are we doing versus others? Okay, if we if we have a this is you know if we have a ten percent growth, but the competitors have twenty percent growth. Well, if we show it, then it makes sense that we're not really doing a good job. But if the competitors they only have a five percent growth, then ten percent is good. So we have to show the growth and the stock price versus either the industry overall or a specific competitor or some other piece of context because data does not make any sense in void it has to be given within a context and this is when you present also ratios they have to be given within a context at the end of this recording i would like to remind you to visit farhatlectures.com again i don't replace your cpa review course all what i'm asking you is to give me a try for one month i can help you pass the exam how i explain the material differently you would keep your course you would use me as an alternative explanation. Good luck, study hard, and most importantly, stay safe.